Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of the People Progressing Podcast. I'm over the moon with uh, excited with Patrice Barber today. Um, she's going to give us some insight on having the ability to start your own business, have the wherewithal to do it, but have the, the strength inside yourself to start your own business, to take that risk and go for it and so forth. She has a great unique story of how she grew up and so forth. So Patrice, I'm going to quit talking because I want to get to, I want to get to you as quick as I can. Why don't you give us an idea where you grew up and how you grew up and, and how that kind of helped form you into what you're doing now? Absolutely, Joe. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast today. I'm really excited about this as well. Um, I grew up a little differently than most folks. I grew up in seven different countries. My second language is Arabic, which I learned at the age of three. So uh, when I go and talk to my Arabic relatives, being half Lebanese, they kind of chuckle at times because my Arabic sounds like a little kid. Like, oh, your vocabulary, mm -hmm. you learned when you were about <laughs> seven or eight years old, right? So um, I, my family moved to Kuwait when I was three years old, which is why I started speaking Arabic there. And uh, we spent about five years there until I was eight years old. And then um, my dad was in the oil industry. And uh, so we grew up, I grew up uh, in that very international community um, in international schools where my colleagues, my, my fellow students all spoke Generally, five languages was pretty common. Wow. And uh, so you feel a little inadequate when you only speak one or two uh, immediately. So you get this peer pressure that happens to learn new things constantly. And so in after Kuwait, I ended up moving to Saudi Arabia. From there, we spent uh, another couple of years in Lebanon and then a year in Iran and then Belgium and France. So every couple of years, I was in a new country, a new culture, a new house, new friends, new school, um, new foods, new everything. Uh, so you either learn to adapt to change really quickly or you learn to um, put a bubble around yourself and be very introverted and um, slow to make relationships and form them. I was fortunate that I had very strong parents and they encouraged me very positively to get out there and make friends and um, helped make that possible and gave me all the foundational pieces that I needed. They, they insisted that from a very young age, learn how to reach out and shake hands and say your name and be bold in how you approach other adults. So I was never um, really allowed to be act like a, a, a small child, you know, that would hide behind mom's skirts. Nope, never, yeah. never an option in our household whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, so that was taught at a very early age. And that's as a child, you do what you learn to do. It's just part of what you do. Um, so that I think was very foundational for me in becoming an entrepreneur and choosing to be an entrepreneur. Now, my father, um, whose parents migrated from Lebanon, um, the Mar mountains of Marjoriyun, when they were quite young um, and with that brought their entrepreneurial spirit and anyone who knows much about the Lebanese culture, uh, we have a long, long history there of being very entrepreneurial as a people. Like everybody's okay. got their side hustle going. That's just something you do. So I think there's a little bit of it in your DNA uh, that you're kind of born with these attributes of becoming an entrepreneur and choosing that lifestyle. Um, Fast forward after uh, living overseas in Europe for um, quite a few years, loved it. I learned French there um, and brushed it, you know, started speaking German a little bit. So added on to the Arabic and, and my and native English. And my dad decided, you know, it's great living here. And we were just getting ready. We moved to France and uh, we were getting ready for me to go to school in a French public school. I was so proud. I had to interview with the headmistress because she didn't think much about Americans. Um, we typically are not very good at math and sciences and things like that compared to our counterparts at, you know, in, in the high school age level, middle school age level. They're typically um, at times advanced. And uh, my French was solid enough that she let me in the door. So I felt very honored <laughs> to be there. That's However, um, I had gone around the corner to the Jolivois with uh, some of my friends. The Jolivois is a, a local pub. Um, where it's open for, for breakfast and things like that. And it's also open for family and, you know, you can get ice cream there, but you can also get alcohol. And uh, I was there with friends drinking my 
gin and tonic at a very young age because that's what you can do in Europe. And my dad discovered this and it was kind of a pivotal moment for him and he decided, oh crap, she's gonna get into too much drug, alcohol, big problems. So we're moving back to the States and we're gonna you know, introduce her to how to say the Pledge of Allegiance and <laughs> learn American ways <laughs> yeah, yeah. and a little bit more um, you know, conservative culture. So, so she'll be ready for college. <laughs> so, so we ended up moving back to the States. Um, and I didn't get to continue on with school in France, but I was invited as part of my, uh, I graduated and went on to mechanical engineering school at University of Texas. And as part of the program, they invited me to go to the Sorbonne um, to do a, a study abroad semester um, with mechanical engineering coursework, but at the Sorbonne. And I, I, that was like one regret in my life that I didn't get to do because my parents couldn't get behind me on it. They're like, I don't know. Um, I had gotten a scholarship to do it and most of the thing, you know, fees were paid, but there was a little bit of added expense to do it. And they were just sort of not really exactly thrilled. So I, that was one regret I had, but ultimately I ended up um, graduating with my degree in engineering. Uh, I ended up switching to Texas A&M and switching over to industrial engineering because I discovered I loved the people part. Yeah. Taking process and engineering process pieces and manufacturing process and all of that. But I really did not um, enjoy the design work that comes with traditional mechanical engineering. So I, I learned that about myself. And I would say that's one of the first lessons that I would say someone looking to uh, discover their career path, what, whether it's entrepreneurial or not, is um, get exposure to as many things as early on as possible. And if you are raising children, I highly encourage you to do the same sort of a thing with your children in middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. Introduce them to entrepreneurial things. Take them with you to um, a networking event. I know it feels really weird and odd, but it is so powerful and impactful for young people. Uh, I was brought by my aunt to a women's uh, uh, luncheon for professional women, I would say, and this was back in the day. Um, and my, my aunt Eloise was uh, a remar remarkably uh, pivotal person in my career as well. I discovered she um, was the daughter of the millwright in the town that she grew up. And the millwright is the flour mill that produces okay. the flour, yeah. Yeah. right? And so that, company was the largest employer in the town that she lived in and she was the daughter of the millwright and so she was of affluence in her community mm -hmm. they had moved from the east coast and brought banking money with them and all of this and so her view of the world was at a much higher level than other people like in my own family um, for just her where she had come from um, her background gave her this view of the world that was so much more elevated and so when i went to this luncheon with her at the petroleum club um it, she introduced me to all these women and again with the training on from five years old of you know, walk up, shake hands, yeah. introduce yourself, right. be proud of who you are and speak articulately. <laughs> Don't make me be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. That's what parents say, right? Don't embarrass me with that. <laughs> Stand up for yourself. So I was very comfortable in the environment as a young girl. I was probably 13 years old, 12, 13, something in that age. But again, very impactful to introduce me to women who were making a difference in their community. And it inspired me as a young person to go, gosh, if they can do it, I can do it. Right. So that's the kind of thing I really encourage parents to think about with their children. Bring them in there, expose them to as many things as you can. Um, as I moved on out of college uh, with my you know, degree, engineering degree in hand, I ended up move, um, getting a first. Well, it wasn't a first job at all. It was about my fifth job. I had worked in a machine shop before I ever graduated uh, both un at both universities and um, worked in hospitality, of course, as many of us do in the restaurant business. Um, running large events and um, high dollar high dollar uh, events for high end restaurants, so I got experience with customer service and then manufacturing experience in machine shop, working on pilot projects, and then Texas Instruments, um, which is also known as the Training Institute. Great place to work. They they understood back in the day what a matrixed organizational structure really should be, where you reported into technically two different bosses. Um, and they knew how to make that work. And again, um, in terms of exposure, I was 
frankly just blessed um, to have opportunities presented and I had the initiative to say yes you know, just yes I can do that and yes I could do this and let me help you get that done yeah so so you know it's a two-sided thing we do make our own luck a little bit in our lives so we have to take the initiative and say yes and um, don't let doubt and fear cloud your judgment like don't let that even get in the way um, so I was very fortunate to be there um, in manufacturing and then um, subsequently was asked to take over a project that was not going well um, where we were rolling out our um, soft we were we used to run the manufacturing with a big book of instructions and you take a box of silicon wafers and you're manufacturing them down a manufacturing line a huge facility 300 people I don't even know how many square feet this thing is it's uh, like takes up Oh, several city blocks kind of thing. It's huge and multi-story. So it's a very large facility and you're dressed head to toe in uh, clean room attire. So it's this white, you know, all white, loves feet, booty, booties. I could get yeah. dressed and undressed in um, under 60 seconds in my outerwear, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. To get into and out of a clean room. Um, so it's a it great learning experience. We were rolling out this project and uh, going paperless is what we refer to it as removing the instructional manuals and bringing in computers because it would cut our scrap and um, cost of uh, waste that happens when you get particulates on these silicon wafers because you're in a clean room from the instruction manual so if you get those out you have better throughput um, the project had been stalled it, it was supposed to take you know a month or two and the person who was leading it had gone on to month three and there was not even 25% done. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I was looking at this going, having been inside the manufacturing facility for several years, I started with 25 direct reports straight out of college um, as the only female in an all male supervisory group. Um, the, I'll never forget the interview question that was the most weird interview question ever when I first accepted this position was, so Patrice, do you have any excess baggage? And I thought, John, what are you asking me? Yeah, I've never heard that, that before. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I had to think about it a little while. He's a Southern gentleman. He's, you know, my father, he would have been uh, 20 years older than I. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I had to think a moment, what exactly would a gentleman like this be meaning? And what he was referring to is, did I have a relationship that was going to cause him a headache? Was I planning a wedding that I needed? He needed. Oh. Did I have children? Was I pregnant? And he needed yeah. to know about that. Was there was there some you know boyfriend in the past that was going to be causing me issues? You know, was I going to bring drama into the department? <laughs> Cause wow. I'm a female, right? Because I'm a female, wow. and females have excess baggage. Mm -hmm. right? so, uh, so after I thought through all that, and I looked at him with this quizzical look, and said, John. Uh, gosh, uh, I'm not engaged to be married. I do have a steady boyfriend. I don't have any children and I'm not planning on getting pregnant anytime soon. Is, is that what you were getting at? And by the way, do you have any excess baggage? I was just like, so you said that to him. <laughs> I did. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and he said, that's exactly what I needed to know. You know what? You're hired. Wow. You know, <laughs> Okay, so this is how it is in the good old boy world of Texas, and you either learn to stand up for yourself and be bold and understand that this is how people do communicate, and it is okay. Um, you, you can either be that person or you can be the meek and mild female who's going to say, I'm not really sure. What is yeah, that going to yeah, yeah. You know, um, there's personality styles, and fortunately for me, my father did not believe that girls were significantly different than boys or should at least not be able to achieve whatever they wanted and do things that boys could do not to say i was ever as strong as my brothers but if i needed to lift the 100 pound thing i wouldn't use my arms to do it i'd find leverage to do it and i'd still get the 100 pound thing lifted and moved so <laughs> figure it out for what things you know for the skills you have and what what resources you have so that's kind of why I ended up moving into, um, after five years of working at Texas Instruments, learning all the basics of 
hiring and firing people. I went through a couple of reduction in forces, had to give those bad news, you know, conversations, performance reviews, um, understanding end to end how manufacturing process works, put together uh, P and L statements. I ended up doing that and during my time there, which was my dual reporting role. I worked for both the finance director and the manufacturing director um, as a manager. And there would be times putting together very painfully on, um, back in the day, it wasn't even Excel. Oh, um, I'm trying to remember what the heck it was called. A Lotus one, two, three spreadsheet mm, yeah, yeah. you're using yeah. to create a, uh, a, a uh, you know, the profit and loss statements to present to the leadership at Texas Instruments. And um, they'd given me all these great opportunities, including that, that one project that kind of launched a whole bunch of different things. The project to go to migrate to the um, paperless wafer, wafer fab, you know, situation. I looked at what was happening in there and, and I said, gosh, uh, you know, I could probably get that done in under 30 days. So if you would like for me to take that over, let me know and I'll take care of that. And they had, they had a certain way they were going to go about doing it, which was from the start of the line all the way back to the back end. And I told him, you know, but the deal is I'm going to have to do it my way, but I will get it done and you will have no additional scrap and no downtime. And then I worked it from the back to the front, took a whole different approach. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and we got done in under 30 days across 24 seven shifts. And there was no downtime and there was no scrap. There was no um, impact, negative impact. And so they said, well, a little whippersnapper, um, we need you to come do this in multiple facilities now across um, in, you know, Texas Instruments International. So ended up doing global projects of rolling out the implementations for this and putting together the playbook for it to say, how do we approach the team members? Because there's literally hundreds of people that work in the manufacturing to run a 24 seven manufacturing yeah, yeah. application group as you know, doing the throughput that we had, there's hundreds of people involved in that. And, um, you have to prepare them mentally for the change that's coming in their job. And you have to know how to speak to them at their level. And these are people with two, two year associate degrees or barely a GED out of college doing manufacturing work. That's quite precise, um, requires skill, but not a lot of education. And so you, you have to understand how do you speak to that audience in the, in the way that gets through to them and resonates, um, which was the thing that was keeping the project from moving forward. They were, they were just kind of slamming it down everybody's throat and not really understanding the training and the methodology of training and the change management issues that needed to be addressed um, to make the whole thing run really smoothly. If you get everybody helping you to get it done, that's very different than you forcing it to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no doubt. I learned how to do global projects and um, software development. Ended up getting pulled in to do customizations on the software they were rolling out because, again, I knew the manufacturing back, you know, everything that was going on in manufacturing up one side and down the other yeah. could, could give them the use cases um, to help them with designing the testing and the requirements and user interfaces and all of that um, to refine what they had started with and rolled out to. Um, global projects and then decided, gosh, you know, I hate Dallas, love what I'm doing on these project things, love software development, um, really appreciate my industrial engineering background that, that helped me to be great in process and process improvement. Yeah, right. I am certain I know pretty much everything I need to know to go start a business. So I ended up going up to moving to Colorado out of all the countries I'd ever lived in and all the states I'd ever visited. I really love Colorado for the lifestyle um, that people choose here. Going out for a bike ride on a Wednesday afternoon is, you know, a great uh, like yeah. thing to do. And it's weird. I rode my bike to work at Texas Instruments and people thought I was the craziest person ever. Can you not afford a car? I have a beautiful car, but I like to get my exercise in. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to see this. They thought I was nuts. So I clearly wasn't wasn't the best fit for for the Dallas, um, the Dallas elite, I will say. Uh, loved the people, however, not exactly a perfect match for me. Um, came to Colorado and just really found my people and launched my first consulting company at 29. And it was all about um, working with enterprise level companies, doing project management implementations, um, and it eventually led to program office implementations. Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, this is great. 
first year I doubled my personal income out of the box and I did it like it, it was consulting services and I, I figured out how to have like zero overhead. So that was all awesome yeah. and highly unusual. By the way, most companies are suffer a loss their first couple of years. You're investing money into getting things going and I somehow managed to not have to take any losses um, and you know steadily grew the company. However, a couple of years in, I, I discovered I knew absolutely nothing about sales or marketing. <laughs> and so the business was never going to grow to be anything more than a, than a solo practice, which in hindsight could have been a great thing. You know, I could have, could have continued to do that. However, after about five years, I realized I also really didn't like doing the enterprise level work. Um, I didn't like the, the really large, you know, fortune 100 to 500 companies where you're coming in as the hired gun and you are then also afterwards not part of the team anymore and you're not part of the community. And so it's hard to build community um, when you're not able to be part of it. So I yeah. discovered these things about myself as I went along on the journey. Um, so, so that's kind of how I got started into the whole entrepreneurial world. You take a leap of faith. You do you do that based on figuring out, um, you know, you've spoken about this before, Joe, about aligning your purpose and your passions. I mm -hmm. knew the things that I love to do and then, and I knew the, the things I had been skilled and well equipped to go do and, and making sure that it's a marriage of the two. I definitely don't advise people going off as an entrepreneur to start something in which they don't have a background or skills. Um, really tough to be successful in that setting, even though you're super passionate about it. Um, I, it's typically best and higher probability of success if you merge the two things together. Um, secondly, I think taking time to reflect on what I had done previously and reflect on what I want to do next um, on an, a, at least a once a, a year basis and looking at the big picture of, um, you know, within Career Connects, uh, which is my most recent company that we launched a platform and, and dedicated to helping individuals take control of their career, whether they want to lead that career down the road of, um, I want to become, I want to start a side gig, or I want to get into the C-suite, or I want to just get to, you know, a senior level position, leadership position, or, um, or I want to go start a whole new company on my own, like actually start an entrepreneurial adventure, be a co-founder and something like that. Regardless of which track you want to take, there's a key set of foundational things you, ha you should do before you make those steps. And the first one is aligning your actions to your why. So figuring out where where do mm -hmm. I want to be with respect to my relationships with my family and friends, with my volunteer work or my charity work, with my health, with my other hobbies that I love to do. I love to play golf or I love to horseback ride or whatever it is. And then how does that fit in with my professional um, goals and uh, objectives there? I, and don't forget monetary, like where, how much money do you want to have in the bank by when? I want to have a million dollars in assets by the time I'm 45 years old so that I don't have to work, I get to work. Mm -hmm. What an amazing feeling that is. Yeah, it's the best. It is, it truly is. And that was always, um, I was again, blessed with Texas Instruments to have access to and uh, availed myself to take um, advantage of training in um, financial, you know, your management of your financial wealth. Um, so beyond just setting up a 401k, but they explained um, a bit more about like planning for retirement. And they, and if you at 23, 24, 25 years mm -hmm. old, if you start in and you get those habits established and you bother to take a little bit of training on the, on the topics, um, wow, does it have a huge impact on your later life? Mm -hmm. I was prepared at 45 to be retired and semi did retire. I told my husband before we got married, we're having two kids by the time they're, they're in kindergarten, don't plan on me being a primary provider, which is when we started our marriage, I was, um, with a very large six figure income coming into it very early on in my career. But I, um, you know, I knew that I, I wanted to, to keep that door open to not be, um, you know, a working mom at that time. And my husband's like, yes, yes, of course, that's where we're going. And then as it turns out, I decided not to be the full-time mom because I discovered again, after you have kids and you go, huh, can I be full-time mom? Or is there a better option? We decided to have a nanny for six years. Best decision ever for me, because when I was with my kids, I was happy, joyous, you know, loving and gentle with them and just hundred percent focused on them because I had 
the adult conversations you know on, that went with with that uh, on the other side of the, my day mm-hmm. um, so and we we were you know, again super blessed went through three different nannies the first one stole the car <laughs> so, so yeah there are bad things that happen yeah. the question is how fast do you pivot and recover yeah and so you call the cops, you recover the car, you go find another nanny and you move on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what now what? Um, people hear that from me all the time. Like Patrice's motto in life is, so what that happened to you? Now, what are you going to do about that? Well, I, I, yeah, yeah, and I, I want to kind of go back to what you just said there to your upbringing. Yes. When kids move like that, especially to different countries and so forth, you probably develop that so what, now what attitude from an early age. Um, How hard was that? How hard was that to meet people, grow with people, and then move? Yeah, great question. I think it has a lot to do with the core structure around you. In my case, My parents were very consistent. Um, You know, my dad had, you know, like family meal was always there, 5.30 in the evening. We always, my mom always had dinner on the table. We sat down to eat as a family. Uh, Now my brothers are 10, 12 and 14 years, 10, 12 and 13 years older, brothers and sisters, two brothers and a sister, older than I am. So by the time I was eight, they were 18, um, 20 and 21 and off to college back in the United States while I was living in Kuwait and you know overseas and so from eight years old on I grew up as not only the baby of the family but also an only child which is an interesting set of mixed dynamics Mm -hmm. Um, because you start out as the baby of the family and you get you get everything you want right you get lots of things but you also have a camaraderie of the family that Mm -hmm. brothers and sisters there but then when you become the only child then that part slips away you don't have your brothers and sisters there to help you along so much as much um, but you do, you are required to grow up very quickly because you're brought into your parents' adult world, right? And so if, and my parents were very, uh, accommodating. My mom, amazing woman, um, helped, uh, was constantly in community at all times from, from very early on in her own life. Um, starting with helping her parents buy their house coming out of the depression. Um, She went and got the tax liens, figured out how do you buy a house buying tax liens and bought them their house to get back on their feet while she was getting out of college. So, I mean, she's that kind of person that just, again, a so what now what person herself. And so those those values got instilled from both sides of my parents and um, were already instilled in my brothers and sisters and reinforced from them. So, you know, they're older and they're like, well, come on, just say hello, do, you know, get out there, do stuff, what? What's the problem? Because they were already older and wiser and could do. So they didn't see why I should have limitations and therefore I didn't see why I should have limitations either. Yeah, so that... it, it's the nurturing environment in which you are brought up in that helps you do that in a very solid way. And I, I want to piggyback on that because you said something that was really interesting to me and I wrote it down. When you said, you know, my dad instilled in me that I can do anything. So my dad instilled in me, your, your example was if I needed to move something that weighed 100 pounds and I physically couldn't do it, I would find a way because my dad instilled in me, it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man, you can do it. That's right. So my question to you is a lot of women coming up growing up and so forth get that from their mother but i don't necessarily think they get so much of that from their father if that makes any sense and i was when you said that it hit me like a ton of bricks am i doing that for my daughter good i'm glad it sparked the you know how yeah how important is it that it came from your dad as well as your mom you know um what the the advantage that it has when it comes from the dad in addition to the mom, is that um, you are validated as a female in in the male-female world. And so um, my, by the dynamics that I learned with my dad, my dad um, also had a bit of a military background as well and, you know, grew up with that type of rigor. And um, 
he was not if he was upset with something that came out and being Lebanese as well like we're very passionate people and we we talk with our hands mm-hmm. usually with see with this and it's very intense kind of conversations and people have told me I'm I'm a bit intense as well but um with my dad being intense what I learned was how to stand up for myself you know because eventually you do stand up for yourself and I, I distinctly recall a pivotal moment with my dad's and my relationship where um in high school he was talking to me a bit about something that I had not done quite the way he expected it to be done. And he was just, and he was, his voice was quite loud. He was literally yelling and in my face, and, do you understand that that's what you need to do? And I just looked at him and I said, do you realize how ridiculous you look and sound right now? And after that moment, I mean, it took him totally aback, but I learned that I could stand up for myself and I wasn't gonna get punched in the nose for it or it was less likely than I might've thought. And um, because of that, you know, grow a spine kind of a a concept, it enabled and empowered me to handle male-female relationships with very strong males henceforth. So anytime I think that women can get in a setting as early an age as possible where they are interacting with males and they can learn to see themselves, and I watched this with my own nieces, um, additionally, who, when they've been around strong male um, presence and learned to, in an appropriate way, stand up for themselves in those those settings, done fantastically well in their business settings because they oh, got the skills to do it. So when someone asks you in an interview, what is your baggage? You have the skills right. to go back at him and say, what is your baggage? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I think that's a beautiful example. Yes. That's a beautiful example of that. It's not always a male female thing. Males end up having situations like this too. And they also can at times, you know, find themselves struggling with imposter syndrome, lack of feeling of their value and their worth and all Mm -hmm. of that sort of thing. And that's, you know, quite true. However, right. We all go through that. The question Mm -hmm. is, how do you choose to deal with it? And what are the tools that you're going to put in your tool bag that later on you're going to pull out and help yourself to get beyond things? Because we will all have moments in our lives where these things will creep in and, um, and make us feel a a loss of self-worth and power and, and a purpose even. Um, and so, having a set of things that you do of process driven steps most of us work well with a process and we're Mm -hmm. not very good at the other kinds of of ways of getting through things but i think the common thing that i find with most of the executives i work with um, is that if i can give them a few steps to take they will get themselves they will walk themselves right out of um, the, the dilemmas that they're in, the negative talk, self-talk that they're experiencing, and um, because they're going to focus on something else and take some steps and do something different. And in that way, they'll leave that stuff behind. It doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it isn't even real. It just means how am I choosing to deal with it? Um, and so these are, you know, part of the part and parcel to why I launched the Career Connects platform is to help people um, have a set of tools they can always come back to cloud-based anywhere in the world, and you can get on there and walk through setting your North Star objectives in these five or six different key areas. Where do I want to be? And it drives everything else that you decide from that point forward. You go, oh, if I want to be making $200,000 a year profit in my pocket from whatever the heck I'm doing, and the thing I'm choosing to do isn't going to get me to that, then is that the right thing I want to be doing? Or is it, you know, is there some other variation of that that's going to help me to get to my goal? And by the way, it has to line up with my other goal, which is I need to have three hours a week working out or five hours a week working out. And I need to be able to go once a week to deal with my volunteer things because I love to do um, mentoring of entrepreneurs and helping them to get their businesses launched. And I want to have a couple of hours that's carved out for me to be able to do all these things that mm-hmm. make me a happy, well-rounded person who is giving back to my community, creating a legacy, and building something for others to help grow our economics and our state and our country. Like, you know, that's what we ought to be doing here. Where's your value that you want to add? How, 
Do you want to go about that? And if you don't have those other pieces in the, of the pie in perspective, periodically looking at all of them going, huh, am I actually fulfilling my other goals? You discover I'm feeling irritated, agitated, not a happy person. Why? Ah, I know, I'm not getting my workout in. And it's not just your endorphins that aren't rushing through your body. It, it's like also other aspects to the mental piece of that mm-hmm. pie that cause it. You know, it's not just physical. It is the emotional pieces that go along. Or I'm not giving back to my community. And so my community is, I'm feeling distant, disconnected from my community piece of my life. Um, we as humans need other people in our lives, even though we might work in a remote, 100% remote environment, which we've been running our company for 15 years as a remote company. Um, but we still find ways to get people together in a different way, in a different medium and keep them connected in deep and rich and meaningful ways that is not all about work so again mm-hmm. that's a key component of what we um, are encouraging our younger generation of um, it, people who are coming into the workforce and moving into their leadership roles to think about these things take control of your career get in charge of it where you want it to go for your needs as well as the company like they have to be mutually uh, inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, that was one of the key things I learned very early on from an amazing mentor that I had was how to go about making the decision of should I stay or should I go? Is this a good opportunity or not for me? Two simple rules. One is, am I adding value to this endeavor? Whatever the initiative is, am I able to add real value? Secondly, Am I aligned with the strategy and the tactics of how we're getting to the goal that we're going after? When I was um, coming out of university and I was being um, interviewed at General Dynamics and Lockheed and um, and, and ultimately at Texas Instruments, um, uh, lots of big name co- um, companies, they all were interviewing me in their defense contractor roles. And having lived in the Middle East and grown up in Lebanon, no, yeah. there, um, at, at a very early age, I had the amazing experience of living in a war zone and, um, and all of the complexity of the politics and, um, and religion and all of the aspects of how do you make neighbors and become friends with people who are Druids and Muslims and um, Jewish and <laughs> Palestinian no. and, and no. those are all your neighbors and you're the one or two percent white minority American in that environment. You're not the majority, you are the minority. And how do you deal with that? And what is the impact of the implements of war on this culture that I was in the middle of that lovely little Petri dish, um, discovering that if we had, didn't have, the, the thing that was constantly the catalyst upsetting the neighborhood activities was when the Syrians and the Israelis would start dogfights overhead and their beautiful little F-14 Phantoms And they're coming at each other, you know, the speed of mock sound, you know, like, so you hear the boom of passing through mock. And then you also hear um, gunfire, you know, and bombs being dropped and Mm. things like that. It's quite loud, horrific, and, you know, it's it's undescribable. You can give it the words, but it doesn't really give you the full meaning. So you learn that that is really the catalyst of the unrest. It's not, yes, there's political things going on and people are talking and they're agitated about this or that, but the people will typically find ways to work things out eventually. Mm -hmm. It is the implements of war that for me were the thing that I saw as the catalyst and I couldn't begin to think of working for a company that was making other implements of war. So I couldn't, I could not get behind working for um, companies in their defense contract groups doing that kind of thing i just like oh no <laughs> i can't support yeah, that yeah. i would fundamentally not be in in agreement with that so i turned down amazing opportunities very high paying positions uh, because i had the wherewithal to think about those two criteria from an early mentor in my career um, telling me gosh are you aligned with how they're going to get to where they're going are you aligned with how you're going to be making your money are you good with that mm-hmm. you know and you can take that to an extreme and say gosh I could um, sell illegal drugs and I could make a really amazing, amazing, you know, income. Uh, am I aligned with that? Yeah, yeah. Aligned with that? So that's the extreme of it. But we get the opportunity to choose in much less extremes, you know, that are not, that are more gray. They're not yeah. so black and white. 
it's not illegal, but is it ethical? Is it, is it, does it have the social impact that I want to have? Right. And so I love it that today, um, our, our, uh, emerging leaders are thinking about social impact and I, I cannot um, overemphasize the, the need to continue with that sort of a, a framework and lens about how do we make choices. So um, I, I hope I answered your question about no, that. you, you, you did. I, you know, males, females and the different environments. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I want I, you, you had mentioned something earlier too about doubt and fear. And then you just brought up the toolbox. How has your toolbox helped you overcome doubt and fear? Because we all have it. I tell people all the time, fear is a natural emotion. Right. And if you if you disc, discount it, it's just going to get worse. You need to right. understand that we all have fear no matter what it is. You know, that there could be different fears for each one of us, but it's a natural emotion. What right. are some things in your toolbox that have helped you get over the doubt and fear that you've encountered? So... First step is in starting with your aligning your actions to your why. So thinking through um, the different areas of your North Star objectives. Where do I see myself? Where do I want to be in these different areas um, in three years, five years, you know, 10 years is a long ways out. And for yeah. most people, really difficult to think about. So just start with three or five years. Um, the average time that people stay in a position is in a role at a job at these days is now 2.7 years on yeah. average. So if you can even think three years from now, where do I want to be um, regarding my career, my choices on all of these different things. So that's number one. And then thinking about if, if I want to be someplace else and I want to be doing something else, what skills, what people, what resources do I need to help me prepare to get to there, right? So maybe you got your college education, but now you might want to get a certification in something else that gives you, you know, I want to move into being a, a data analyst. Well, get a business, uh, a business intelligence certification that gives you a little bit more skill and preparedness for that. Surround yourself with the people that are in the new community you want to go to or the, the type of community you want to go into. Um, one of the things that Chris Pelly is one of my favorite mentors as well. One of the things he talks about is if you want to um, get introductions to affluent people, find the richest church, synagogue, mosque in your neighborhood and start going there and get on, you know, get engaged in there. Mm -hmm. And you will, in, you will inevitably be introduced to the most affluent people in the neighborhood because yeah. they're all there. And that's exactly the kind of thing I learned when I was growing up. We would always, when we moved to a new place, one of those, you know, like dinner on the table at 5.30 each night and everybody shows up to eat together, is also going to um, church. In our case, we happen to be, you know, in the Presbyterian church. And overseas, it's a community church of any religion, that you, any Christian yeah. you can get together with, even Catholics, Methodists, and Presbyterians all combining together because getting to a church and finding a, a location that you can quietly meet in um, without getting chastised by the local government was in and of itself a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of, of stability and community, that's so that's kind of second in there. How do you prepare yourself? And then, you know, connecting into your network, how do you create the network, find the network, um, commun communicate with them, stay consistently with them, um, and then ultimately any any final ways of, of handling conversations. So for me, when I said I didn't learn know anything about sales and marketing, I really mean that I didn't know um, how to have a uh, create a sales funnel. I didn't have any idea about lead generation and the need and how to do that when I when I started my first company. Um, but you do eventually have to learn those things if you're going to go into the entrepreneurial role. Um, and by simply setting up the next actions you're going to take will allow you to overcome the fears. It's not that you don't have them. You need to understand them, get clear about what they are, and then decide what am I going going to do about that and then take one more step forward one step one step one step oftentimes if you're struggling with that for more than i'm going to say a few weeks um you need to get somebody else to come alongside you mm -hmm. and i don't mean that you know you need to go get help like you know a psychologist or something that's not quite it um they're learning one of the, the key things i learned to do was to ask for help eventually um you know as a strong female, you, you feel like I can't ask for help because that makes me sound weak. But in reality, 
Um, if your strength is demonstrated and then you also for a specific thing come back and ask for, I need a little help on this thing, people really honor and respect that, um, that level of humility at all ages, across all generations, I have not found an exception to that rule. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, it, it ingratiates you with them and helps you to actually build a relationship and rapport simply by, you know, coming to the point of humility of asking for help. I just really need a little help on this. This is an area I am struggling with. And I know that you're an expert in it and I would love to learn more about that. And that goes to the point of creating your, you know, bringing in your mentors, your, your champions, um, that when you're feeling down and fearful, you have a conversation with one of your champions and they will in 60 seconds or less tell you, what are you talking about? You're doing amazing at this, mm -hmm. you're doing this. And do you forget, did you just forget last month you already achieved this? Um, the other key thing in the tool in the toolbox is to celebrate your wins. And this for many of us who are type A is a very difficult thing to do because gosh, what I got done last month, well, hell that was last mm -hmm. month. Now what am I going to do? You know, if I didn't get something done right right now in the immediacy of it, I don't really think I achieved what I achieved. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when we built the platform, we built in the ability to every month in, to encourage, enforce, reinforce, and have you write down what you achieved month by month by month, so that you can see the small wins that make up twelve wins in a year and a whole bunch of major accomplishments that come out of it that we just. Oftentimes as individuals, we don't, we don't choose to see it. We have a hard time seeing it. We, we have a hard time admitting to it. I, I graduated in the top 3% in my um, high school class, magna cum laude. I had no idea until my senior year that I was magna cum laude anything. No. I didn't, you know, I was like, oh yeah, sure. I got straight A's and I got an A minus right there. What the hell is that? <laughs> no. So, and that was, um, there wasn't something my parents beat into me by any stretch. My brothers and sisters all had differing levels of competencies and schoolwork. And my parents were like more focused on, are you happy and well-rounded in your school setting? than are you getting straight A's? So that was a personal thing that was instilled by my peers in international schools who had very type A parents that, you know, yeah. they were the generals, you know, yeah, NATO yeah. generals, um, children and ambassadors, children and people who had a, in my mind, a lot more pressure on their life <laughs> and what they had to demonstrate outwardly. So, so I'd say aligning your purpose to your, um, to your passions, reflecting annually, finding mentors and champions for you. Um, uh, remembering that things are not always greener on the other side, you know, like the grass is not always greener. And so, um, look at where you want to be three years from now and is what I'm doing going to get me there? Um, that that's probably as good as you can do. One one point of reflection for me on my career path when I switched from my large corporate um, clients, my I had I have no idea to this day how I was garnering clients from MCI in the day and Intel and um, Hewlett Packard and um, here local to Colorado uh, US West Quest, mm -hmm. um, you know, huge huge companies. And I just would walk in, you know, just fall into these um, opportunities to put, to come in and lead multi-million dollar projects for them. And in hindsight, I'm like, wow, I just was totally ballsy and gutsy and just went and talked to people and said, yeah, of course I can do that. And if you want to get it done, let's get started. And that yeah. was kind of, <laughs> and I was yeah. like, okay, how much? Great. Here, sign, start soon, quickly. Um, so it was kind of that, that approach, but I discovered I didn't like the enterprise level stuff. And when I switched, I ended up moving into a business to consumer model, which at the time I didn't realize it was business to consumer versus business to business. And my income ended up dropping because again, I didn't know anything about sales or marketing and I didn't realize business consumer has to be high volume in order to get to the number of zeros that you used to get. You have to sell a lot more pieces and parts. And I didn't run my numbers as effectively as I should have, um, which is why I went and got help. I became part of Thai Denver, in fact, which is um, an organization focused on entrepreneurship. Back in 2008, got engaged and involved because I needed help and I needed yeah. people who were experts in it too, that provided training and other mentors and people who had been there and done that before me to say, ah, here's the thing you missed. And if you look at this little part here, you're going to decide that this is a better path for you, or here's how to correct the course. So, you know, having those, um, those mentors and then, you know, reflecting on 
on did you know if, if I need to make course corrections, so make them. Don't don't get hung up on um, like beating something into the ground until you're completely defeated with it. Think about stop a moment. Think about what kind of small course corrections. Entrepreneurs are known for pivots. We, we get major ahas, we think we're on a path and we get a major aha and we go, oh, wow, if I went just a slight variation over here, I could get so much better results mm -hmm. out of that and it's better aligned with my skills or my team or whatever. Um, and, and then that last thing that I, I mentioned before about just the decision-making criteria. At any time, the two questions I've found most helpful to ask myself is, am I adding value to the thing I'm doing? You know, if I join an organization Am I able to add value? Well, I'm clearly not going to add as much value if I just show up and attend as if I'm going to get on a committee. I'm going to add a lot more value. And by the way, I'm going to get a lot more value out of it if I join in a committee. Now, how much time? Ah, now we're into the strategic and, and tactical aspect of, you know, am I aligned with the way that I'm going to get there? Well, I only have five hours. So on this committee, can I get five hours a month in, or is it going to require 20 hours a month, in which case I'm going to fail because I can't give 20 hours and they need 20 hours. Mm -hmm. So am I aligned with how we're going to get to where we're going means figuring out how we're going to get where we're going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so those two things, you know, those two questions have served me so well in, in figuring out if I started, if I start this entrepreneurial journey, am I, you know, able to create value for the people that I'm going to be doing whatever I'm doing with delivering my service or my product, you know, either way. And am I aligned with how we are as a company, as a new company going to get there? Am I going to have the tenacity to um, withstand what's coming? And I, I, would, I would even add, do, do I feel valued? Yes. Yes. You know, do, I, do I feel valued? valued right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I, yeah. Am I feeling like this is going to be something? Yes. You have, and that speaks to your passion. Um, if you're doing things that you enjoy doing, you are passionate about it because you do receive energy back from the thing that you're doing and you feel um, rewarded and, um, and gratified in what you are doing. Not because anybody really says, says mm -hmm. terribly much, although the, the affirmations that come quite naturally um, are, are very helpful. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether you're giving somebody a product and they love the product and they're like, man, when I use your product, whatever your widget is, um, I get this, this, and this great, awesome things out of it. You know, if I'm selling a dress, these dresses make me look amazing. If I'm selling hardware or software, it really helps our team get more effective. Really appreciate what you brought to us. We were able to increase by 20% what we were doing before. Those kinds of things. If you're consulting or coaching, same thing, of course. You know, you're, man, the, the sessions with you were amazing. Life-changing. That's mm -hmm. what we want to hear. And so you, you got to measure that to see, am I delivering life-changing and amazing? Yeah. And uh, that's awesome. if I'm not, why not? And so again, asking for help, asking people, what is it that would be helpful for you? What is it that would um, make this better for you? You know, getting getting honest with that. Just so. such powerful stuff. I last question. Gotta get going here. I know I've taken up too much of your time. I'm an entrepreneur or want to be an entrepreneur. I want to change careers, change my life, change whatever. How do I get a hold of you for help? It's the you best way to get a hold of you. Yeah, careerconnects.com, careercnx.com. Jump on the website, send send me a message anyway on there on our chat, anywhere it all gets back to me eventually. The team will help get to me there. That's an easy way. Um, LinkedIn, I'm there at Patrice Barber. LinkedIn and Patrice Barber straight away. Um, so definitely connect with me. Happy to help explain how after three successful exits and uh, another company I started and had to close the doors on, what you do, what you don't do, what it takes to get started, um, which by the way, is an amazing amount of sheer tenacity and fearlessness. You gotta yeah. be fearless and tenacity. You, 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 Love you, it. you know, get out there and think of it as a marathon. It's not a sprint yeah. um, to do entrepreneurial endeavors. We talk about exits in a five year time frame. Most people don't make it till 10. That's just facts. Um, we'd love it if we had investors and we get investors, you can do a five-year exit game plan. If you get the money up front to, to ramp up that fast, um, created 5 million in under two years. And that was, you know, definitely a highlight for me. Um, and, but we had a, an amazing team to get it done. So yeah. it can be done. Love to talk to people about it. Patrice Barber on LinkedIn. You can find me there. 
That's awesome. I want to thank you so much for coming on. Um, thank you, Joe. I, I, I'll do anything I can to help people steer people your way. Um, we have so many good, so many things that are in common in our ways of thinking. It's it's really kind of really fun to talk to you and so forth. And uh, I just want to thank everyone else for listening to uh, the People Progressing podcast. Uh, you can get a hold of me through Coach Joe White consulting.com and buy my book and all that and get a hold of Patrice uh, uh, through LinkedIn and so forth. But um, thanks for listening. And I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you so much.